Okay, everybody, let's wrap up tonight with a talk on sprayable biodegradable mulches. Okay, plastic mulches are used to suppress weeds, and we've talked about them earlier in the forums. But the disposal of these plastic mulches is costly. It's costly to the environment and it's costly to our pocketbooks. So NDSU is working in collaboration with other universities to develop environment friendly, sprayable, biodegradable mulches. Now, I just have to say this presentation is a higher end presentation, okay? This is not fluffy stuff here. We're, we're gonna learn about some serious research. I think it's very valuable for us avid gardeners to see the type of research that goes on in NDSU and all the work that it entails. But we gotta focus in this presentation here, okay? Now, here to share with us her findings on this topic is Dr. Greta Greenmig. Greta is an associate professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at North Dakota State University. She teaches courses about weed identification, as well as weed biology and ecology. Greta's current research interests include non-chemical weed management, integrated weed management, weed ecology, and weed management in organic production systems. So Greta, welcome to the forums. Thanks, Tom, and welcome everyone to this final talk for this evening. And as Tom mentioned, I'm going to be talking about a research project that I am doing with a lot of different collaborators you'll see here. And this is a big grant funded by the main USDA program that funds organic research. And our goal is to develop and evaluate biodegradable liquid applied mulches to replace polyethylene film in organic horticultural production. And so why would we want to do this? Polyethylene film or plastic mulches are very, very widely used in horticultural crop production, especially in organic systems where they can't use herbicides. And there's many reasons. They're inexpensive. They suppress weeds really well. They modify the soil temperature to provide optimal growing conditions for the crop. They retain soil moisture and they are often used to contain soil fumigants as well. But there's a number of drawbacks associated with plastic mulches. They absorb and concentrate pesticides that are applied. They're very difficult to remove. They're super fragile and thin. They tear, they break into pieces. They're not readily recyclable. And all those plastics, whether they're in the soil or in a landfill or in the water, require hundreds of years to break down. It's becoming an issue in our society that we're becoming more and more concerned about because we really don't know all the health impacts that may result from the ubiquitous exposure to these mi microplastics. And you might be thinking, well, I know that biodegradable plastic films exist, and they do, but they're currently not allowed for U.S. certified organic production. And that's why we were given this grant to work on trying to develop liquid applied biodegradable cellulosic mulches. So we're working with a large team, and the team in Montana State was working on developing and testing the physical properties of a bunch of different hydromulch formulations. That's what we call this liquid applied mulch. It's called the hydromulch. And they tested a number of different cellulosic fibrous materials that you'll see on the screen and added a lot of plant-based tacifiers, gargum, psyllium husk, and camelina meal. They added those at two, four, and 6% by weight dry matter to hemp herds, cellulose paper, thermally treated wood fiber, and then some combinations of these. And they, they tested some physical properties. Here are the physical properties. They tested tensile strength, puncture resistance, rain fastness, soil adhesion and density, all things that we suspect might be related to the ability of these mulches to resist weeds. That's the main function that we're interested in is weed suppression. 
Some of the things they found were that the paper really worked best, especially with a tachyfier added. And uh, gargum was better for strength, but the psyllium husk and camelina meal were better in the rain fastness test. And they're also thinking that we might look into the hemp a little bit more. It didn't perform as well as paper alone, but that material is less costly. And we found a new source of it that's more finely pulverized that we think might be a promising material. But we decided to go ahead with some field trials using the paper-based hydromulches. And we conducted these field experiments last summer in Washington and North Dakota. And we were testing five different hydromulch formulations. These were paper only. And then we had two and 6% psyllium husk, two and 6% gargum. And we compared all five of these treatments to the polyethylene mulch, which is the weed-free industry standard. And so we applied the mulches first at about 4,500 kilograms of dry matter per hectare. And then we planted our bare root strawberries into these mulches. And this gives you an idea about what the field sites look like. The mulches were applied to standard raised beds that we built with a bed shaper and a tractor. And then on the left is the North Dakota site. On the right is the Washington site. And you can see our application equipment, which was tractor mounted. And I'll give you a little view about what that was like. Here's a video of the machine that we developed in North Dakota applying the hydro mulch at our site. And the Washington machine was similar. It, um, performed almost identically to the machine. It wasn't identical in components, but it was identical in action for the most part. We did have some application issues that we're hoping to solve. We had to apply two or three passes to achieve adequate coverage. So we'd like to get that down to one pass and we're looking at some double nozzle configurations to try to achieve that. Also, we realized that applying before planting might always not be ideal. And we're working with a farmer who actually is working on a system to transplant first and then apply the mulch on top of the transplants. And so we'll see how that goes. Another thing we notice is that the soil surface roughness affects the coverage. And so that's something that we need to understand better. And also we noticed that sometimes we thought small weed seeds were dispersing via wind onto the top of the mulch. And so that could be an issue for people who have lots of bare soil in their system. So those are some of the things we're going to work on. I thought just for people, I, this isn't really meant to be something that home gardeners could do, but I thought I would mention that we did do this project on a smaller scale previously. This is one of my graduate students applying the hydromulch slurry using a regular backpack sprayer that we modified a little bit. And you could potentially shred some newspaper and mix it in a bucket with an immersion blender as is shown here and then apply it this way. If you wanted to test it out yourself, it's pretty simple, just shredded paper mixed with a little bit of gargum would be a good formulation. And then in Washington, the group there was playing around with not having to shred the paper because we usually were using, in our trials, we were using shredded paper. So they would soak their crumpled newspaper sheets in water for 12 hours. And then they would mix it first with a paint mixer to kind of chop it up into tissue sized pieces. And then they would use the cement mixer in the center to achieve kind of a finer liquid hydromulch preparation. So those are just a few ideas. If you think you'd like to give this a try, I don't really recommend it, but some people are interested in that. So I thought I would throw that out there. So this is a picture of what the hydromulch at Absaraca in North Dakota looked like with the 6% gargum. And you can see that it formed a pretty nice surface. It repelled the weeds really well. And the strawberries grew really um, excellently with it. 
I thought I'd show you a few of the results and hopefully these graphs don't throw you off. They're really easy to read on the horizontal axis, which is the X axis that's showing the weed density. So the longer the bar is, the more weeds there were. The um, plastic mulch had zero weeds. So that treatment isn't included. We're just comparing the hydromulches. And we measured the weeds at two different times, peak emergence, and then later on in the season. And at peak emergence, we saw that the gargum formulations suppress the weeds a lot better than the other ones. So we're, you know, pleased with this result. That was a pretty low density of weeds. And this was a result that was consistent across our sites. Then when we get to the later weed density assessment, the two sites were a little bit different. There was a lot of variability at the top of this figure are the Washington results and the little A's mean that all these means were the same statistically. I know they don't look the same, but if you look at these T-shaped bars, those are the errors and that shows the variability. So there was so much variability that we couldn't really tell these means apart statistically. So it looks like they were different, but they weren't. But in North Dakota, we saw the same pattern we saw earlier, which is that the six and 2% gargum formulations suppress the weeds a lot better than the other hydromulches. So that was weed density. Um, we also saw that when we split the weeds into broadleaves and grasses, and this was at Washington only, that the formulations differed in their ability to suppress grasses. And this is interesting because we've noticed that grasses are hard to, harder to control with the hydromulches, and that's because of their morphology. When they emerge, they just have a single little coleoptile leaf. It's like a little needle, and it's really easy for that needle to find any tiny hole or push through that hydromulch. And so we did see that the gargum formulations were better at suppressing those grass weeds, which is an important result. Looking at total weed biomass, we see that um, for the Washington site, there really wasn't any difference again, but at the North Dakota site, we did see that the 6% gargum had a little bit less weed biomass associated with it. We measured mulch deterioration and we saw that in Washington, there was really no difference statistically, although again, it looks like there was between the poly mulch and the hydro mulch formulations. But in North Dakota, we saw that the polyfilm was as good as the gargum. So again, that's another vote for the gargum, maybe being a little bit better. Here's some fruit yield. Uh, we measured marketable yield in both weedy and non-weedy areas of our plots. And at Washington, even though there were tons of weeds in the hydro mulch, we didn't see a difference in yields. And this is something that they've seen many times in their trials out there in Washington that the weeds don't really seem to impact the strawberry yield all that much. And so it's kind of a vote for in some systems and some scenarios, maybe weeds aren't always that big of a problem and we can learn to live with a few weeds. In North Dakota, we had a very interesting result, which is that the gargum formulations, this hot pink bar and the chartreuse bar labeled with the bees, those had higher yield than the polyfilm and also the paper only. And that was very surprising to us. We noticed that the strawberries flowered later in the polyfilm. And we think it is a temperature effect. In North Dakota, we have very hot summers compared to Washington. And I think that black plastic mulch was just too hot for the strawberry plants, whereas the hydro mulch was more of a light color. Um, this was also in uh, marketable yield in a weed free area. So this is showing the effect of just the mulches without the weeds. And we see similar patterns as in the weedy areas. There were no differences 
among the mulches in Washington and then in North Dakota, we see that the gargum formulations performed a little bit better than the other mulches. To conclude, we will be continuing with this project until 2025. And in the coming years, we're going to be evaluating these hydro mulches in blueberries in Washington. And then in North Dakota, we'll be looking at their performance in an annual vegetable production system. And the coming experiments will contain a lot more information about the soil impacts that would result from incorporating all of this cellulosic material into the soil. And we're also going to continue to refine our formulations and improve our application methods. And the study also will include some comprehensive economic analyses to compare costs. But our goal at the end, again, is hopefully to come up with at least a step forward in terms of developing a commercially viable biodegradable mulch that could be applied to uh, raised beds via spraying. And again, this was a collaboration between Montana State University, Washington State University, North Dakota State University, and the USDA ARS. So lots of different groups and lots of different people. And with that, I will take any questions if you have them. Okay, thanks, Greta. Uh, can you see what the heck is guar gum? And is it expensive? And where can you buy it? What's it come from? Um, it comes from a, a plant and it's just a plant based gum and you can buy it. We got ours at an herbal supply store. It's a very common food additive. It's like if you buy coconut milk in a can, look at the label. It will almost always contain gar gum. So it's an edible gum that's in a lot of foods. And we got ours from this herbal supply company in Oregon called Mountain Rose Herbs. But I bet you could just get it on Amazon. It's a pretty common material. And then the psyllium husk is also from a plant, um, a plant seed. And that's the same stuff that's in the, uh, it's like a dietary aid called Metamucil. You might be familiar with that. So it's the same stuff. And the Camelina meal, which we didn't use in our field trials, but we're still working with it in the lab and in controlled environments. That is a byproduct from, uh, growing an oil seed called camelina. It's a brassica. It's related to field pennycress and maybe canola. Um, and the seeds are pressed for oil and then the solids are left over. And so the camelina meal are the solids left over from that. So okay. that's a great question. How about like when you, uh, when you're like putting in the transplants, so you spray over the bed first Right. And then do you plant immediately or how fast is that hydro or that, um, I want to call it hydro mulch, how fast is that harden off? Oh, that's a really great question. So, and, and luckily the picture you're looking at shows this. This is what it looked like right after we planted it. So we'd spray on two coats and after the second coat, the hydro mulch would still be relatively flexible. And we used... Um, kind of just a flat metal bar to push the roots of the bare root strawberries into the soil. But we had some other studies that I didn't talk about today where we were looking at cabbage as well. And for that, we waited until the hydro mulch was more hard and we used a hole cutter to punch a hole in it. And so you could do it either way. And we just use a little hand trowel and planted the plants by hand. Uh, I think that for some crops, it would work better to plant the crop first and then apply the hydro mulch on top. And a farmer that we're working with up near Grandin has a system that he hasn't gotten it to work quite all the way, but he did have a system that was applying the mulch to a transplanted row of kohlrabi. We did this last spring 
And the four, I thought the force of the application would break those plants, but it didn't. They were really resilient. He just didn't have the right nozzle size and he didn't have a powerful enough pump on his tractor to drive the, um, the pump to mix the hydro mulch to be smooth enough. So it kept clogging the nozzles. So there's a lot of technical details right. that have to be worked out of the process. But if you sprayed directly on top of the kohlrabi or whatever, do you have to wash it off right away? Or do you apply water on top of it to wash off the hydro mulch off the plant? No, it didn't really seem to coat it the way we had the nozzles aimed. Hmm. It didn't, it didn't, uh, it was aimed so that it didn't really cover the top of the plant. Just scoot it along the side of the plant. It was kind of angled and it, and it formed kind of a fan shape uh, pattern just below the leaves of the kohlrabi. Okay. So they, they grew just fine. According to the farmer, I talked to him about that last week, but we just couldn't, we didn't get a high enough rate on to um, suppress the weeds because of some uh, problems with his equipment that he's working on. And, and so when you do depend on that hardening process, how soon do you follow up with the planting itself before the material hardens or how, how fast does it take for that, that mulch to harden? It depends on the weather, but if it's relatively dry and sunny, it will harden in about 24 hours. Okay. But you can plant whether it's, if it's hard, you need to have some way to punch a hole in it. Really? And so we were using a drill with a hole cutter on it that okay. you could just punch a hole nice and clean, you know, because if you just try to stick a, a shovel or a little trowel into it, it'll crack and split. So you need to sort of punch a clean hole and then plant into oh, it. Okay. I think that's not going to be, it, that would not be a viable method on a large scale, but strawberries are planted into plastic mulch. We were copying a pretty standard planting approach for strawberries and so I think the strawberries would be planted into the mulch after it's sprayed. But for other crops, I think it would probably be better to pl transplant the seedlings and then spray it on. Okay. So how about the, how long does this mulch last? Like how fast does it degrade? Is there any, could it use it? Could it be there for two years? Mm, I don't think think so. I think you'll still, and we'll find that out because we haven't, done that yet but in the spring uh if the snow ever melts <laughs> yeah. we will go out to absaraca and see what's left and i have a feeling we'll still be able to see some of it but you i don't think it will be intact enough to use again you'd have to apply it every year how about uh, what what specifically is there about that guar gum? Why did you choose guar gum? Is that for it's tachifying or like what is that? It's what does that thing do? It's sticky and it. I see. It helps the paper fibers. It's like a glue. You can think of it just. We call them tachifiers. That's the technical okay. name for yes. it, but it's really just like a glue that helps to glue the paper fibers together to give them a little bit more cohesion and strength. Okay. Does the, does hydro mulch, does it affect the pH of the soil or the soil microbes? Well, that's what we're going to find out because this first project was just a one-year project we needed to do to see if we could even get this stuff to work at all. Like it was a lot to figure out how to apply this stuff and how to make it. Uh, but so we only looked at weed suppression and crop performance last year, but in the coming years, we will be doing very comprehensive soil 
uh, health measurements to quantify those impacts. If I had to guess, I think that we will certainly see some impacts of incorporating a high carbon material into the soil. How much, I don't know. It's not a huge amount. It's probably not even as much carbon as a typical crop residue. And so it may not be a, a very great impact, but I have a feeling that it, you will see some shift in microbial activities and we will see some shift in nitrogen cycle dynamics. pH, it, it might lower the pH a little bit if I had to guess, because adding more organic matter will acidify the soil to some extent. So those are some of my predictions, but we don't know. Okay. So like this spring when the snow melts and you get out there and you look at it, what, what will you do with it if, if the mulch isn't there enough to do the job? Do you just Are you just going to till it into the the soil there and replant? Is that what you do with that? Well, we're done with the study. So, I mean, in an, an, in, an annual, in an annual system, mm -hmm. you, you know, they would apply new plastic mulch every year. You know, they would reform their beds and put in fertilizer and then apply the mulch. And this is no different. So mm -hmm. it's not a permanent thing. It would be an annual application just like the plastic mulches and people are asking about the strength of the mulch as far as will the strawberry runners penetrate it or will the squash or pumpkin runners on the vines will they penetrate this mulch um squash doesn't make rooted runners does it no i don't think that so this particular strawberry variety is a day neutral strawberry and we remove the runners so it's not like a matted row system where you would be looking for runners to proliferate and root in day neutral strawberries are just grown as annuals and so oh. we didn't we actually removed all the runners but i don't I don't know. They might, they, they probably could find their roots in the soil a little bit better than with plastic. Yeah. But you know, in a strawberry, we're, we are trying to match a strawberry plastic culture system, not a matted row system, which right. is something that people are probably a little bit more familiar with here, yes. growing June bearing strawberries in a matted row system. And that's not what we're trying to do. Is this system somewhat comparable to just uh, gardeners who lay newspaper on top of their beds? Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it's the same idea of using a paper-based product. The thing about newspaper is it's hard to anchor down and the, and you know, there are commercial paper sheet mulches. There, it's a product called Weed Guard Plus. And we're using that as a comparative treatment in a different study with a different grant that I'm doing. And because it doesn't conform to the soil, it's very rigid. It tends to get torn up and broken up by the wind. It doesn't weather very well. And one of the nice things about the hydro mulch is it's applied as a liquid. So it conforms to all the micro topography of the soil. It's very stable. It's mm. not going to be blown mm. off by the wind. Did you have a problem with it being clogging the, your sprayer because of the the viscosity of this type of mulch that you're using? Uh, no, we weren't using the typical sprayer that one would use for, say, an herbicide application. These um, machines, it's basically a large tank, and we use a really powerful motor from a commercial hydro seeding machine to mix the slurry so it's really smooth. And then we have a lower powered gasoline powered um, pump that we use to apply it because we don't want to apply it with a huge amount of force. And 
but it's enough force that it doesn't clog the nozzle. It's a one inch brass nozzle. So it's a pretty large mm -hmm. nozzle. It's mm -hmm. not like a tiny nozzle that you would use for herbicides. Right. How about, you know, could you envision this uh, being used for shelter belts with trees? You know, people use landscape fabric for to get their trees going there. Tons of maybe just to get them going. Sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, just, it's I only mean, one year. It's only gonna last one year. The the Washington group is doing all their trials in blueberry, and that's a really similar type of idea. I mean, they're you know, and they're perennial mm -hmm. trees or shrubs. And with this type of hydro mulch, you're, you're using water can infiltrate the soil. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. How is this comparable to like when you look at along the highways and such, when people use this green hydro seeding for lawns? Right. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's very comparable. It was the whole idea was really inspired by that. What we're trying to do is just adapt uh, hydro seeding, which is like you're saying, you it's a commercial preparation that mixes grass seed with shredded paper cellulose and you mix it with water and spray it when there's uh you know you've got a big disturbance from some kind of construction project they use it to stabilize mm -hmm. those disturbances right. and that's what we were initially inspired by but there that equipment and the and the formulations that are available none of them are able to be used in mm -hmm. organic certified organic production because they use proprietary ingredients that we couldn't even find out what they are and the application equipment is meant to spray this stuff say 30 feet or 50 feet out it's really forceful and so we're trying to develop application methods that are suitable for horticultural systems. And it's very different. Yeah. You know, you had a different or different results as far as the weed presence or impacts in Washington and North Dakota. And this person is wondering it the fact that Washington as much has more rain. That is that re one reason why maybe the weeds didn't have as much impact? We're in North Dakota. We're yeah, we're not scarce. really sure. Uh, and that's one reason why, um, and I didn't mention this when I was speaking earlier, but on this slide, you see I've got wet versus dry hydro mulch performance. And that's something that we're looking to test in a lab to look at the impact of the wet versus dry. But I, it could be other things too. So one issue is just the sheer weed seed bank density. Right. And the site that we used had been in perennial alfalfa out at Absaraca for about five or six years. And there just weren't the main weed that was out there was common purslane. And mm. if you know anything about, and some common lambs quarters, those are two very, very small seeded annuals. And those are the easiest ones to suppress with the hydro mulch. And as I was mentioning earlier, the grasses are the hardest and they had more grasses in Washington. Yes. And another issue, the thing about the seeds blowing from bare soil onto the top of it, that was happening in Washington. And they thought that a lot of the weeds were not coming through the mm -hmm. mulch, but were rather blowing in mm -hmm. from bare soil. So hopefully you would not be having, usually we don't want to have a lot of bare soil everywhere. You know, so right. hopefully and hopefully you wouldn't have that, but it could also have something to do with the wet versus dry. But the other thing is uh, these trials were all irrigated. And yes. so it wasn't like 
they were just dry all the time. They did get water pretty regularly. And so I, I, if I had to guess, it's probably all of those things put together. Here's a question. What type of millage is required to block weeds? Does that make sense to you? What type of millage? Oh, uh, they talking Dense. about thickness of yeah, the material. Density. We were we were using oh, yeah, one right. we were using one mil thick plastic mulch. It's extremely thin. It's oh. just tissue thin. Yeah. And that blocks the weeds. We had a hundred percent weed suppression at both sites from that very, very thin. It's so it's so fragile and easy to puncture, but it you know, it will suppress right. all of the weeds. So it doesn't take much, but it's different with a material that's organic. So for instance, if you're trying to use cover crop residue, you know, you need quite a bit, um, maybe somewhere around 5,000 tons per hectare of dry matter to adequately suppress weeds. So it depends on the, the material how thick it needs to be or how dense it needs to be. How about just wrapping up? What's your gut feeling about where this is going? Like, are we going to, in 10 years from now, are we going to be spraying our raised beds with uh, biodegradable, sprayable mulches? I, I really don't know. It could take longer than that. Certainly this is not a project that's going to lead to a commercial commercially viable solution at the end of this project. It would take numerous iterations to fully develop the idea. And there are other groups that are also working on this. So it's, it's an idea that has a lot of traction because of the e extreme concern about the plastics in our environment. And I think that the main thing that would help it go forward is if we eventually had some kind of restrictions on the use of mm -hmm. plastics and then that would drive it forward. And I don't know about the economic costs. I suspect it would be somewhat more costly, but one of the, our goals was to use waste streams. And so for instance, the Washington group, they're actually using a slurry that they get from a facility in Washington that's recycling old apple boxes. And so a lot of these materials are free or almost free. And so hopefully that would help with the costs. But I think that the main thing that would drive it forward is to have plastic mulch become less acceptable overall. Mm. I don't, sometimes yeah. I wonder if people realize, you know, they're buying these vegetables at the store and they don't realize the amount of pollution that producing these crops requires. And a lot of people will burn that plastic instead of disposing of it because it's so expensive to dispose of. And so the environmental impacts of it are considerable. That's one of the reasons why I was motivated to engage with the pro project in the first place. Okay, well, we're just going to have to see where it goes. Yeah. And we wish you it's, good luck, Greta. It's high risk, you know. Well, it, it definitely is. It's it's really interesting. And and I think uh, we wish you good luck with it. So Thanks. thank you for the presentation tonight. I under, I think it was very understandable. You did, I think, a great job at downing it down for me. So I, I, was, I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. And now we're going to wrap it up tonight. We're going to stay on time. And we'll just say next week will be our last night of forums. And we're going to learn about trees and how to landscape in small spaces. So that's our focus next week. We hope you all have a safe rest of the week. And uh, we'll see you next week at the forums. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.